Hello, everyone, and welcome to Representation in Birding, a Wikipedia edit-a-thon with BirdNote and friends. We are here to build community, learn from each other, and make the online world of birds and birding more welcoming, inclusive, accurate, and representative. Please be mindful of the fact that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on BirdNote's YouTube page. Closed captioning is available as an option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. My name is Nick Byard. I use he and him pronouns, and I'm the executive director of BirdNote. I live and work on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup people, where they make their home and speak the Lushitsi language. We at BirdNote commit to the ongoing work of uplifting Native communities and protecting the land and resources that sustain us all. This event and others like it are necessary because of the legacies of colonialism and the impacts of white supremacy and patriarchy on so many aspects of life around the world. In the United States, where most of the organizers of this event are based, the theft of native land, the theft of black labor, and the US government's central role in perpetuating racism and oppressing women and gender minorities since its inception have worked together to create massive wealth, health, and opportunity disparities in all aspects of American life. This has led to distorted representations in media, literature, and history that center those who have historically had the most power and control over institutions. This leads institutions and individuals to develop self-fulfilling prophecies about who belongs where. We all share a love of birds and bird watching and hope that through this event, we can help more people from diverse backgrounds see themselves as having the opportunity to share in this love. Wikipedia is the largest and most read reference work in history. So we have a chance to make a real difference by making the content on bird related pages more inclusive. We also hope that you'll walk away from this experience with more knowledge about editing Wikipedia pages so you can feel comfortable making changes on your own. I'm thrilled to share that we have over 150 cities represented in this meeting and at least 16 countries. A special thanks to those of you joining from time zones where it is very early or late. Here's a brief overview of today's schedule. I'll begin with a keynote speech from the amazing Rosemary Mosco, and then introduce all the partners who've come together to make this event happen. From there, we'll hand it over to the experts from 500 Women Scientists for training and editing work in breakout rooms. And then we'll all come back to wrap up 10 minutes before we close. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat so we can get them answered. Please also make sure you're muted for the duration of the event unless you've been invited to speak and feel free to turn your camera on or off based on your level of comfort. We wanna make sure this is a kind and welcoming environment for everyone. Bullying, harassment, or spamming of any kind will result in us removing you from the event. We'd love to hear your feedback. So after the event, we'll be sending out a survey and we ask that you share your thoughts with us so we can improve our events in the future. I wanna express gratitude to 500 Women Scientists for providing the concept of the Wikipedia Edit-a-thon and the technical expertise we need to make this event a success. I'm very grateful for our partners, Black AF and STEM, Seattle Audubon, the Galbatross Project, the Feminist Bird Club, BirdAbility, and Wikimedia New York City. I strongly encourage you to get involved with any of these organizations whose mission strikes a chord with you. A special shout out to BirdNotes Communications Director, B.B. Baxpabian, who's been the lead organizer for this event. Thank you, B.B. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to share a little bit about BirdNote. We're a public media nonprofit organization, and we believe that birds connect us with the joy and wonder of nature. By telling vivid, sound-rich stories about birds and the challenges they face, we aim to inspire listeners to care about the natural world and take steps to protect it. We exist to connect people of all identities, backgrounds, and levels of interest and experience to the joy of birds and the comfort and healing nature can offer. You can learn more about what we do and listen to our shows at birdnote.org. And now, please allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, science writer and naturalist, Rosemary Mosco. Rosemary makes books and cartoons that connect people with the natural world. Her Bird and Moon Nature Comics won the National Cartoonist Society for Best Online Short Form Comic, and were the subject of an award-winning museum exhibit. She makes best-selling science books for kids and adults and gives keynotes at birding festivals. She's written and drawn for the New York Times, Audubon, PBS Kids' as Eleanor Wonders Why, Ranger Rick, and more. Her favorite glacial landform is the Esker. Please show your welcome to Rosemary however you're able, whether it's through an emoji, comment in the chat, or clapping your hands. Welcome, Rosemary. Hi. 
Oh my goodness. I am so honored to be here. You have no idea. I'm just, I'm so, so, so excited. So uh, let's get rolling. Hi, do I sound loud enough to everybody? I'm a quiet person. Great. All right. So hello, I am, I am Rosemary Mosco. I'm a cartoonist and a science writer, and I'm really, really thrilled to be part of this event. I just can't get over how many amazing groups are here and amazing people. And I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. So um, one of the reasons I'm excited to be here too is because I'm with kindred spirits, people who find peace and beauty in the world of birds, um, like this white rum sandpiper that I saw a few weeks ago. And so we know that this is a this can be a serious and calm and beautiful world, but it can also be a really, really silly and hilarious world. And that's kind of where I like to hang out. So um, for example, recently I was looking up photos of shorebirds on Cornell's Macaulay Library to get some drawing references. And in particular, I was looking up pictures of red knots because I have not managed to get a good photo of one once, um, a photo of one so far. So here is a beautiful photo by Martina Nordstrom of a red knot that I saw, this beautiful foaming water. Here's a glorious photo by Ryan Sanderson of this red knot with this perfectly matching background. Here's one by Daniel S. And you can see a little bit of that red knot red on the breast, just beautiful. And then I found my favorite photo on this library of all time, behold. So this photo by David Turgeon is maybe the best bird photo I've ever seen in my life. I really appreciate that it mentions there is an additional species in this image. It is a semi-palmated sandpiper, although you can't see all the field marks. And I also appreciate that this photo was rated um, five stars by 22 beautiful, wonderful individuals. Although if I could have rated it, I would have rated it more stars than can fit um, in the Cornell Labs um, servers. So, uh, so yeah, birds can be really silly and this is fun, um, but it can also be a useful thing. Also, I have two parrots there in the other room. There's white noise, they have treats. It's not working, so I apologize. You'll hear little birds, but I think it's appropriate. So uh, one great thing about humor is that it can help science. Um, so I find that if I take a scientific fact, no matter how dry, and add a little joke or a little piece of humor, it will spread to communities and, and interests and groups and you know places that you wouldn't normally expect. So the moment that I really kind of found the power of humor was when I made this chart really long time ago at this point, years and years and years ago. Um, and it was about what to do if you find a baby songbird out of the nest. So at the time I was working for wildlife rehabilitation and we would get people bringing in fledglings all the time, which are, which are baby birds that do not need to be rescued and do not need to, to um, find help most of the time. But people really cared about birds, so they would bring them in. And so these are sort of older young birds. So I made this chart to explain what you should do if you find a baby bird at various ages. Um, and you know, I spread it around online, but I added this sort of silly piece here where there's a little dinosaur. This was, you know, Jurassic Park was still fresh in my mind. So if your bird has many sharp teeth and a large call on the second toe, it is a dromaeosaur. Um, if it has seen you, you should back away slowly and do not show fear. And if it has not, you should run for and look for others that attack from the sides, which is a complete Jurassic Park joke. So I made this really silly joke and I thought, all right, I'm going to make a silly version of this chart and I'm going to make a serious version of this chart and I'm going to put them online and everyone's going to ignore the silly one. They're all going to share the serious one. And I was surprised that people really liked the funny one. And that was the one that they shared and that they spread. And so I thought, OK, this is this is great. I'm on to I'm on to something here. So I also make comics that poke gentle fun at us nature people, myself fully included. So here's one that I made recently. This character says, hey, do you want to drive really far and spend hours staring at distant, rapidly moving gray-brown objects while trying to find subtle differences between them? The other person says, no. Then the first person says, but what if they're bird-shaped? And the second person says, then absolutely, yes. And then, of course, they are going shorebirding. Um, so yay, shorebird season, woo! And then um, this is fully autobiographical because here's me a few weeks ago crawling on the ground looking at all sorts of shorebirds um, and getting sand all over all over me and all my clothes and my camera and my backpack. 
So really quick, how did I become a science cartoonist and why did I think, you know, this was a, a fun thing to do? Well, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. Um, hopefully there are some folks from Canada here. So it's north, although it, it could be norther, but it was a pretty, pretty chilly place to grow up. And so this is the most Canadian photo of all time. So here I am as a little kid with a scarf that my mom knit for me and I've got my giant, giant, giant coat and I'm feeding a black capped chickadee. So I spent a lot of time being outside in nature and then a lot of time being warm and cozy inside with my mom and here with some family friends reading what is doubtless some kind of animal book. And I'm probably telling everybody all the facts in it. And so um, another thing I should mention is at the time it was the 80s and early 90s. So here's me um, getting dressed up for a, a dance contest. And this is like really, these colors are so 80s. Whenever I see this picture, I think about poison dart frogs and how they have this aposomatic coloration to avoid being eaten by small mammals or birds. And so clearly this is what's going on here is that I'm trying not to get eaten by um, you know, any sort of small mammals. So because it was this particular period of time, which what was big was newspaper cartoons. So I read cartoons like The Far Side or Calvin and Hobbes or For Better For Worse or Bloom County. And I had all the collections and I read them all the time. And that was all I wanted to do was make more of these. So I made my own. So here's a drawing. My mom sent me all kinds of <laughs> awkward kid, kid art. Um, for this this talk and future reference, but here is a unicorn telling a horse, uh, "What did I do wrong, honey? You're acting as though I never existed." And I wrote "existed" like several times because I couldn't figure out how to spell it. Um, and I probably stole this joke from somewhere else because I was, you know, just learning how to do this. I made cartoons about dinosaurs too. So here's uh, one of my favorite dinosaurs, the Parasaurolophus, but it's a parent Sauralophus. It's a pun. And um, yeah, it's got all of these little babies. At the time, I was probably closer in age to the little baby dinosaurs. So my mom probably saw this and was like, oh my goodness, she's making mom jokes, but she has no idea. Um, anyway, so that was the kind of thing that I did. And so I love both nature and drawing and I wanted to grow up and do um, both of these things and explore both of them. But uh, this was a tricky thing, and I'm sure a lot of you can empathize with this because a lot of the messaging that I got as a kid suggested that art and science are really separate. So we had science class, we had art class, and we didn't do anything that blended the two of them. This was long before STEAM and even long before STEM. So um, this is still true to this day. If you search for, for example, on Google images of science and art, you get images of the brain, and this is just such a common trope that is split down the middle and half of it is science and half of it is art. And the art side looks really fun and the science side looks really drab and has like graphs and, um, you know, there's business people having a meeting. And um, some graphics show some overlap like this one here, which has Einstein, it's always Einstein. And then Georgia O'Keeffe is the artist. And then the overlap is like a galaxy, which is not super helpful for me figuring out what I wanna do with my life. And there's very, very, very often a gendered component. And also usually the people portrayed in these images are white. Um, so, I was kind of stumped, but I slowly got older and realized that actually, you know, our history is full of examples of science and art mixing and enhancing each other. So this is one of my favorite examples. This is science art from 30,000 years ago from the Chauvet Cave in France. And this is showing woolly rhinoceroses, which are currently extinct animal, but um, ancient people saw them. And so we don't know what these animals look like in real life, but our um, very, very ancient cousins illustrated these animals with um, a dark stripe running down the middle. And so what's cool is that conventional artists today are able to take that, that um, information and make science art based on it. So this is by Maya Kerala, this beautiful illustration. And what this is, is 30,000 years of science art um, and artists reaching across 30,000 years and shaking hands, which is so cool. Um, there are all sorts of other examples through history and today. So Elizabeth Gould is 
Um, a classic example, she supported her much better known ornithologist husband, John Gould, and did these beautiful, beautiful artworks. And then on the right, Chelsea Connor does um, dew pops, which are anole illustrations of um, anole lizards clinging to popsicles that are colored like the uh, dewlap, the sort of throat flap of these anoles. And I think they're so cool. Um, and so she's actually, I think, on our list of Wikipedia folks who, you know, could deserve a page. And so, um, you know, I started to see science and art not as two separate things and not as two overlapping things that are like highly gendered, but as, you know, one and the same thing with this long, rich tradition, all these cool people doing this stuff now. So I stuck these two things together and I decided to try to make a life out of it. Um, and it's been a really meandering path without a whole lot of guidance. Um, I've gotten to do some incredible things. I did uh, graphic design like this pint glass for herpetological meeting. I drew some horrifying geese and other critters. I made really gross books about nature for kids. I've um, led field walks and had numerous snakes poop all over me. Um, and I've been really, really lucky and privileged, but I've also run into a whole lot of biases doing this kind of work. And so um, here is an extremely speedy speed run tour of some of the biases that I've come up against that people who do this sort of work um, experience. So really fast, uh, there are biases against women in art. So uh, this survey of artists in major US museums found that 87% of the artists in the museum were men. Um, there's biases against women in science. We know that women are credited less in science than men are, um, like this, this paper by Ross et al. in Nature. Um, there are biases against women who just talk about science. So we know that when women communicate science, there's identical work attributed to male authors that is considered more scientifically robust, um, you know, and that was this Matilda effect paper. Um, that got a lot of buzz recently. There are biases against women who mix humor and work. So we know that um, from this uh, study here by um, Evans et al, um, gender and the evaluation of humor at work, that humor expressed by men is uh, more likely to be attributed, to be uh, interpreted as functional. Um, whereas when women make jokes at work, it's, it's sort of seen as nonsensical. Um, there are biases against communication, outreach, and other work perceived as women's work. So, for example, um, I got this great uh, paper by Catherine Hope talking about, in archaeology specifically, which was my major, outreach and education are typically considered women's work, and there's been a noticeable lack of formal recognition for outreach labor. Um, and I am queer, and queer science professionals also um, wind up encountering all kinds of systemic inequalities, like in this uh, Czech uh, article that was in science and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was a complete speed run. There's so much more. Um, and I want to put a giant disclaimer here that I am cis and I am white and people who are not face, you know, there are not enough slides <laughs> for all of the biases that people encounter. And it's so, so, so frustrating um, because we all just really wanna do our work and build communities and create you know, a happy and, and functioning world of birding. So throughout all of this, birds have really been a constant for me in a source of solace and people like you have been you know, a source of tremendous inspiration because there is power in us and in the bird world. So I'm gonna end with a cartoon that is hopefully um, maybe uh, inspirational, maybe terrifyingly inspirational. So uh, this is an older cartoon, but um, if you ever feel small and insignificant, I feel you should look to this animal here, the Northern Pygmy Owl. So this is a bird that weighs 60 to 70 grams. Um, that I calculated is about the, um, about the weight of a fistful of eight of those famous number two pencils that we use to fill out tests. So eight number two pencils, but um, I apologize for the predation images, but it can catch really, really, really giant prey. This is an incredibly powerful, tiny, tiny, tiny bird. So here's the cartoon I made about it. So it says, feeling small and insignificant, meet the Northern Pygmy Owl. It is just six to seven inches long but it sometimes catches prey more than twice its size. It's a brave little creature that, whoa, go easy there, buddy. Oh, oh no. Um, 
So yeah, we are all a lot more powerful than we know. Please don't go <laughs> catching any moose though. Um, so I think it's really important that we do what we're doing today and we work to break down barriers inside and outside of birding because it's going to make birding so much better. Um, and we really need uh, more people to safely and experience, you know, the wonders and joys of birding, including, you know, the peace and the humor and the calm and the inspiration and every single aspect of it, including whatever these birds are doing here, because <laughs> this is the kind of thing that we all need to see more of. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I'm just so excited to get to editing with, with all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. I think we've got, um, and yes, let's give Rosemary a big round of applause. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. If um, if anybody wants to raise their hand for a question or feedback, comments, um, um, I just loved everything you shared, Rosemary. Does anybody have a question or um, um, maybe want to want to make a response? Susan. Okay, I would like to ask Rosemary um, what media she uses in her artwork. It's very, it's just very inspiring, and I I would like to do something similar, but I I haven't done art in so long, and I would like to know what are some of the more updated <laughs> media. Yeah, um, I, that's a great question. Uh, so I use Photoshop. Um, I use a a drawing tablet, a Wacom tablet, and um, and yeah, so I'm all digital now, but I want to say there are, so first off, don't be intimidated about, you know, any sort of inability, perceived inability to draw any sort of like, you know, I didn't go to art school, you know, we're, we're, we're all doing our best, but there are people who make comics with pen and pencil, with watercolor, with just pasting together their photos with clip art. Um, you can do, you can do anything. So please do. And then send me what you do because I want to see it. So good luck. Thank you. Anybody else? I go time for maybe one more question. I know I rushed through all those papers. Please email me if you if you want yes. the cavalcade of papers. But yeah, great. And, and Rosemary, if you, if you could put any um, links to your work or uh, contact info if you want in the chat, I'm sure people would love to to see it. And thank you again. Thank you. All right. So. Um, Thank you so much, Rosemary. Uh, we'd like to introduce our partners and give uh, each of them a minute to tell you about their work and how you can get involved with them. Uh, first, I'm gonna uh, ask Dara, Dara Wilson to say a few words about Black AF in STEM. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here and I'm so grateful, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so grateful to hold space with all of you. Thank you, Rosemary, for that wonderful keynote. I've been following you for years. And it's really nice to actually just see you virtually. So yes, um, my name is Dara Miles Wilson. I am a representative of Black AF and STEM. Several of our members are here. I see Sheridan, I saw Nicole Jackson, I saw Deja Perkins, um, all members <clears throat> who were involved in this project a lot longer than I was. And I, as a person who watched what happened in 2020 in New York Central Park, who watched the results hang of um, response by this awesome group. I'm so privileged and honored to be here and speaking with you all about it. Um, so yes, again, my name is Dara Miles Wilson. We at Black AF and STEM, we were formed in 2020 after an egregious incident of racism happened in New York Central Park, um, something that a lot of Black individuals are very, very familiar with. Um, but it was, what was so unique about this was that it was recorded and everybody could see it. And even more so unique and special was, again, the response. Everybody understood this is not okay. We need to do something about that. And this group created Black Birders Week in 2020. Um, this past June, we celebrated our third annual Black Birders Week. And for the first time, we had events in person and online, and that's incredible. But what I'd like to see from this um, event that we're holding here, a lot has happened since 2020. And there are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of individuals. There are a lot of people. How do we keep this information up to date? And I'm so grateful to be here with you all again. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Tara. Um, next, I'd like to uh, ask Megodipa Maiti uh, to say a few words about the Feminist Bird Club. Hi, this is Megodipa. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am calling in from uh, Pocomtuk lands and I am on the board of the Feminist Bird Club. FBC was founded in 2016 and has since expanded to almost 30 chapters all over North America and uh, Europe. We're here to share the bird joy that we all experience, but more importantly, we're all about the people. We, we're all about celebrating the people that love birds. Um, we strive to make birding and the outdoors safe, affirming, and accessible to folks who might not have equitable access to it. We believe in transformative justice and in helping each member of our community grow into the best version of the birders they want to be. Um, we also hope to leverage people's passion for the environment to create lasting social change. And since our inception, we've actually raised over $100,000 for social justice causes. Um, anyone anywhere can be a part of the Feminist Bird Club. Um, we're gonna post the website down here, but you can find out if there's a chapter near you that's organizing bird outings. You can tune into one of our virtual events or just share your birding adventures with us on Instagram. You can tag Feminist Bird Club. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megatipa. And um, next, I'd like to ask Wendy Walker to say a few words about the organization soon to be formerly known as Seattle Audubon. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Wendy Walker. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am here representing Seattle Audubon, uh, and I'll get into that in a second. We are looking at changing our name. We are a uh, we were founded in 1916, and I was just reflecting back on the the three issues that this organization started on was. Uh, encouraging people to keep cats indoors, tree poaching, and uh, creating a bird sanctuary at an area of Seattle called Seward, now called Seward Park. And amazingly, um, at least two of those things really are kind of still relevant today. So we, 100 plus years on, we are still um, an organization that really focuses on advocating and organizing for cities where people and birds thrive. And we very purposely put people in that mission statement a few years ago to just emphasize that kind of like Megadupo was just saying that it's about the people who go birding. If people are not caring about birds, the birds have lost their champions. We need them, but they need us too. And that reciprocity is something that I think about a lot. Um, people often ask if I'm out, if I am a serious birder, I am not. I am a very whimsical birder. I do not ever want to be taken seriously, which is why Rosemary's art speaks to me so strongly because I love the whimsy of it. Um, but we do do a lot of urban conservation. We work a lot on um, issues like uh, birds colliding with glass, reducing rodenticide risks, uh, and in fact, still that dreaded cats indoors conversation. Um, I'll drop our website in the chat. We would love to have, even though we are based here in, in Seattle on uh, the lands of the Duwamish peoples, we love partnering with people um, as, as much as we can uh, and just get this whole movement of diversifying birding um, and sharing assets that we have. So that is something that uh, is, excites me a lot. And um, we also like to say that we work with people from age three to 103, from fledglings and friends to you know anything for bird sits or online birding, trying to make any, any experience of birding as accessible as possible. So I will, um, oh, and just if you're interested in the name change, I'm gonna actually drop uh, another website um, or one of our web pages. This is just news coverage of the name change. If you would like to see people in the birding world lose their minds, suggest that you don't want to be named after an enslaver and see what happens in the comment section. And that's where we are, thanks. Thanks so much, Wendy. And you all have a uh, one of the, one of the best FAQ sections on that topic on your website that I've I've seen. So thank you for putting that together. And um, next, we'd love to call forward Joanna jo Joanna Wu to uh, speak about the Galbatross project. I'm not hearing you, Joanna. Is anybody else hearing Joanna?
gonna try, does this work? Sorry. There it is. Yep, thanks. All right, thank you to Birdno and to Rosemary. My name is Joanna Wu. I'm one of the five organizers of the Galbatross Project, an effort to raise awareness of and appreciation for female birds. Female birds are beautifully understated and receive less attention in the birding and scientific community than male birds, but we think they're quite cool in their own right, like how the Belted Kingfisher is named for the rufous chest band that only females have, and how you can tell certain birds are female just by the color of their eyes. I'm fascinated by the fact that they don't have always have the same biology as males, so you can't assume that they do, they use the same habitats or such. Um, and that can lead to conservation consequences if females are not studied separately. So next time you're out for a walk, join us in looking for females birds. It's definitely harder, so you'll, you'll kind of take yourself to the next level too. Um, and be sure to share your sightings with hashtag Galbatross Project and hashtag female birds. Thanks so much, Joanna. Uh, next, we'd love to call forward Meg Wacha with Wikimedia New York City. Thank you so much. So my name is Meg Wacha. I use they, them pronouns. And in addition to my great love of birds and of all of the organizations here today, uh, I am the president of Wikimedia New York City. Um, and there are a bunch of Wikipedians in the room here, and we are so excited to share Wikipedia today with all of you. Uh, while today's conversation is going to largely focus on English Wikipedia, this is very much a multilingual international project. There are Wikipedias in over 329 languages, each with its own set of policies policies um, written by a community with its um, own set of practices. Wikimedia New York City is a local node in this truly global movement, and we are an entirely volunteer-run nonprofit which connects New Yorkers and New York institutions with Wikipedia and the larger free culture movement. We run local events with universities, nonprofits, and cultural heritage organizations, organizations, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, community-based archives, activist organizations, and even, yes, the social media account Depths of Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is the encyclopedia that anyone can edit, but we recognize that not everyone does. And it's critical that we increase the representation of historically and presently excluded communities in both the content and community of Wikipedia. It's why I started editing over 10 years ago, and it's one of many, many reasons why I'm so excited to see all of you here today. Because what Rosemary said is true, right? We are all more powerful than we know. Small edits yield a big collective impact. Um, and so we are incredibly honored to join everyone today in support of this important work. Thanks so much, Meg. And I think our representative from BirdAbility is not able to make it. Um, jump in if I'm mistaken. But uh, BirdAbility is, is an organization that uh, has the vision that birding truly is for everyone and everybody, everybody, regardless of disability or other health concerns. And uh, Bibi's put there, link in the chat. You can check them out. Um, great. And so thank you so much to all of our amazing partners. Um, right now, I'm honored to introduce uh, representatives from 500 Women Scientists, Farah, Francesca, and Mariam. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Can I just get a thumbs up that people can hear me? I see thumbs up. And now, can I get a thumbs up that people can see my slides? Awesome. I still have to check. You never know. But yeah, hi everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to BirdNote for putting together today's event. Thank you for all of you for showing up. And thank you to Rosemary for such an inspiring keynote. I've seen your cartoons everywhere and it was such a pleasure to hear from you today. And yeah, today we're here to talk about how to edit Wikipedia. I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but first start, I'm curious. How many people in the room have used Wikipedia before? Show of hands. See quite a few. Nice. And then my second question is, have you ever edited Wikipedia before? I see a couple of hands. Okay, but that's what we're here to do together and learn. All right, so Wikipedia is the fifth most popular website in the world. It's something that we all use very often and there are actually five core pillars behind this encyclopedia. 
The first is that it's an encyclopedia. It's not a news outlet. It's not a soapbox. Everything person mentioned within sort of has to meet a notability criteria to deserve their own page. Not everything can end up on this encyclopedia. Another core pillar is that it has a neutral point of view. So when you're writing or editing a page, you want to make sure that you're leading with the facts, you're not coloring it with information that you may personally know, and you're really trying to make sure that the information that you're sharing is reliable and can be verified. Everything on Wikipedia is free content that you can adapt for something else that you're using. So that's why it's incredibly important to make sure that you're citing sources, that you're not plagiarizing. Uh, another core pillar is respect and civility. So uh, the entire Wikipedia is, is written and edited by volunteers. So being able to work together online, you know, looking at everyone else's edits, making suggestions, and always trying to assume that, you know, people are coming from a good place. They're coming because they want to help make Wikipedia more complete. They want to add more information. And you're really trying to approach your conversations with respect and civility and trying to help make Wikipedia the more comprehensive with each edit. And the last pillar is that, you know, I've mentioned all these four pillars, but there really are no firm rules. And one of the things that Wikipedia really encourages is that folks, you know, be bold, make edits. No one edit can break the encyclopedia because we can reverse changes and we can help make Wikipedia be more complete with every new edit. So yeah, you're going to hear a lot about being bold from me for the rest of today. But for start, why are we here? You know, Rosemary's really touched upon this and all the partners who spoke talked about different aspects of why we need to make sure that the birding community is more representative of the world. But let's focus it more on Wikipedia specifically. So we're here to celebrate the diversity of the birding community. We want to make sure that the pages that exist on Wikipedia are reflective of the birding community in the world. And we're going to do this through editing, improving, and maybe even creating some pages today. Why does this matter? Well, as I mentioned before, you know, Wikipedia is the fifth most visited website in the world. In a typical month, Wikipedia can get over 15 billion views. That's a lot of people who are coming to this website for information. And I always go back to this uh, piece that Dr. Jess Wade and Dr. Mariam Zeringlum, who's here in the room today, uh, wrote in 2018, where they pointed out that who edits Wikipedia and the biases they carry with them matters. Because yes, the encyclopedia can be edited by anyone who has time, a reliable internet connection, and reliable sources. But we do see that there are certain folks who edit Wikipedia more often, and the biases they carry do translate over. For example, today, only 19.3% of English biographies are about women. That has actually increased from 15% back in 2014. So it's actually taken many years of hard work from single Wikipedians to large groups to Wikipedia edithons to like today to really address that gender bias. I don't actually have numbers on racial bias, but you can imagine how much harder it may be for people belonging to historically excluded communities to also have pages to meet notability criteria and sort of navigate the deletions that sometimes occur on Wikipedia. So there are gender and racial biases that exist on Wikipedia, and it's been many, many years of hard work to really address those over the years and something that we're going to continue to address today. Uh, there are lots of people who are working on these issues. For example, there is the Wikipedia Wiki Project Women in Red. There's the Wiki Project Women Sciences. There's us over here at Fire Women Sciences. And some of the reasons why we edit are to challenge stereotypes, to change the face of science. We want to make sure that people can see themselves in science, that science is actually representative of the world at large, and that the pages that exist on Wikipedia do reflect the diversity of scientists who exist. And it's also to foster trust in science. We want to we want people to see that they are represented in science, that their community is represented in science too. I keep defaulting to science because science, science is hard, but the same applies to the birding community. We want to make sure that the communities who bird are also seen in the pages related to birding on Wikipedia. Uh, but as I mentioned, Wikipedia is an encyclopedia. Not everything can be a page in Wikipedia, and there's sort of notability criteria to meet. I'm going to start off by talking about the notability criteria for academics, but then I'll talk about general people. So 
picture an academic. Perhaps they're a professor, perhaps they're working in industry, maybe they're working in nonprofits. And when it comes to creating a page, a Wikipedia has certain criteria that they want a person to meet. So perhaps they have significant research contributions. Maybe they've published a major paper. Perhaps they've uh, won, you know, significant award or honor or distinguished appointment at a national or international level, or maybe they're leading like an academic institution or a significant nonprofit. So these are some of the notability criteria that an academic would have to meet in order to be eligible for a page to be made. Uh, there are a couple more. I've listed them on this page. They don't have to meet all of them, but one of them is enough to meet the notability criteria. So that's sort of what you have to, what academic would have to meet to in order for a page to be created about them. But now keep in mind what Rosemary said in the beginning about all the different biases that exist within a field like science. You know, women are sometimes less likely to be acknowledged for their research contributions. They may not be nominated for awards. They may not be selected to lead. And so, yes, there are biases on Wikipedia, but there are also biases within our broader society and our world. And so if I'm going to mention women, if women or other people belonging to historically excluded communities aren't being nominated for those awards, if they're not being selected for leadership roles, then there isn't sort of that those reliable sources that exist that Wikipedians can cite to create the pages in the first place. So it's a bit of a chicken egg scenario. There's probably a better analogy, but that's the one I'm going with for today. And if we're thinking about people in general, here's the Wikipedia notability criteria for a person in general. So uh, the first point points out that there needs to be significant coverage and reliable sources uh, to show that they meet the notability criteria. Significant coverage, meet, for example, it could be a book dedicated to that person. It could be, it's got to be a thorough coverage. It can't just be a trivial coverage. So it can't just be sort of a name that's mentioned because they gave a quote, but there isn't actually, you know, coverage or information about that person. It needs to be a reliable source. So, for example, articles from the Daily Mail are blocked on Wikipedia, I believe. But something like the New York Times or the Toronto Star, if you're from Canada, would be considered reliable. Uh, Wikipedia usually tends to prefer secondary sources. So those are things like newspapers. Uh, primary sources like journal articles can sometimes be cited. But in general, look for news pieces, radio pieces, uh, interviews. Those are good sources to rely on. In general, you want to make sure that the sources are vetted. So, for example, it's not an interview perhaps where the person submitted their own answers, but it's an interview that went through editorial approval, some sort of peer review. But yeah, that's sort of some of the background knowledge on Wikipedia and the things that you would have to consider when creating a page. But you don't just have to create pages, you can improve a page, you can create links to pages, help strengthen those in between connections to pages. You can upload photos to Wikimedia Commons. So I know that a lot of birders like taking photos. So if you have a high quality photo of a birder or a bird and you own the rights to that photo, you can upload it to Wikimedia Commons and help add more photos uh, to the library that exists. You can also translate a page if you are bilingual, multilingual, uh, you can take a page that exists in English and translate it to a different language, or you can create take a page that exists in your language and translate that to English, because there's so much more than just English Wikipedia. And of course, you can also create a page. So going back to this, be bold. I know that I've mentioned a lot of information, but remember that one of the pillars is that there are no firm rules. Your, your edit cannot break Wikipedia, and we can honestly reverse a lot of changes. You should, however, always save your work. That's one thing we can't reverse. <laughs> so I'm going to get us started on step one, which is to actually create an account. And I'm going to drop a link in the chat in a second. All right. It should now be in the chat. So if you click on this link, you're going to be directed to a dashboard which looks like this. I'm going to give everyone a minute to get to the link. And when you make it to the dashboard, you'll probably see what you're seeing on my slides right now, which says, hello, 
You've been invited to join representation and birding Wikipedia Editathon. To join, you need to log in with a Wikipedia account. So if you have a Wikipedia account, you can log in. If you don't have a Wikipedia account, you can request an account right now. So I'm going to pause here and give everyone a few minutes. If you're struggling, please raise your hand or drop a comment in the chat. And I will keep an eye for account requests that are coming in. And the other Wikipedians can also help. <laughs> I'm on it. Awesome. Thank you, Meg. Okay, I see about eight requests that have come in, so those are being created. Yeah. Oh, in terms of thinking of usernames, you can be creative, you could have a bird, you could use your real name if you want, you don't have to use your real name. Um, yeah, have fun with your username. Okay, I'm seeing more requests coming in, which is awesome. Is anyone struggling with the page or are you just struggling with the username? Brainstorming. <laughs> All right, I see 46 people are now registered. I'm just going to give it another minute. All right. In general, this dashboard that you're seeing is how we're going to track edits for the day. So by the end of our edit-a-thon, we'll actually see how many words have been added, how many references have been added, the total edits, the total number of articles edited. And the cool thing is if you come back after a week, after two weeks, you'll also see the number of times people have viewed your edits. And you can see how those changes actually add up over time and how 20 words that you might add today may be viewed by over 100,000 people uh, a million in a year or so. So it's really neat. I love it. Awesome. Okay. I will return back to my slides. So we've now created the second hardest thing, which is an account. The first hardest thing we'll get to in a minute. But you may be wondering, okay, now can I edit? We're getting there. <laughs> So this is what a Wikipedia page usually looks like. Uh, you've got your title, you've got your text, you've sometimes got a photo, you've got that little box on the side, which is an info box. And if you scroll, you'll see these different headings like early life and education, academic career, and so on. So this here is Jane, who is at the NOAA, which is the Oceans and Atmosphere group, I believe. And I want to bring your attention to a couple of things. So. You'll notice that first paragraph or two, that's called the lead section. It's usually a summary of that person. So who are they? Where are they working? And sometimes people will sort of sneak in, you know, why do they meet that notability criteria? And they'll make it very clear, you know, this person has won a major award. This person has won, is appointed to be the president of some institution. So that's called your lead. You'll notice that some of them will have a list of headings. You don't have to create those list of headings manually. They'll be automatically generated, uh, but that's an easy way to navigate your page. Uh, you'll find that the rest of the text will be, you know, balanced content. You want to aim for a neutral tone. You want to make sure you have citations. Uh, you'll find references. So we're going to aim for secondary sources today. So, you know, reliable newspaper articles. You can throw in some primary sources if you want to. Uh, again, you don't have to physically generate these sources yourself. 
we'll walk you through it later. It's all about dropping in a link and Wikipedia can usually automatically generate the citation for you. Sometimes you might have to do it for yourself. Uh, I also want to point you to uh, these three little tabs here. So with the arrow, you'll notice that I'm pointing to the word edit. So when you're usually looking at Wikipedia, you're just reading the page. But if you select the word edit, you'll actually be able to edit the page, which I'll show you in a second. There's also view history. So you can actually see the history of who has edited this page, what changes they've made. There's also a sandbox, which is sort of like your personal area where you can make drafts and so on. Uh, you're welcome to edit in your sandbox, but today we're going to be editing pages directly, but you may explore sandboxes in your breakout rooms. Uh, you can upload files. You can, you'll can. you notice that this one here says WebMZ. That's the name of the Wikipedia user who was editing. You'll usually find your user account name there. There's also a talk page, so a talk page for your own user page where people might leave you messages. And there's community portal and more. I'm not actually going to show you what this looks like if I was editing a live page. So let me try sharing my screen here. So this here is Wikipedia. I'm going to take a page like Don Baisley. So if I click edit on this Wikipedia page here, you'll notice that it, there's a little button here. And you can actually switch between the type of editing that you want to do. The first time that you edit, you might actually see source editing. So you'll sort of see this user interface where it's where it's more like HTML tags. It's not the most user friendly, at least for me. I don't. It's really hard to edit uh, through this. But if you switch over to visual editing, you'll notice that the Wikipedia editing interface is actually really like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. It's just a case of writing out a, sign, a sentence, which you can highlight, format, change into a heading, bold, italicize, and so on. Um, I hit remove, but yeah. So you can sort of get a sense that editing Wikipedia is actually really hard, easy. It's a case of just selecting edit, picking the editing style that you like, whether that's visual editing or source editing, and always making sure to save your changes. So for example, if I will try, just gonna add a word. Let's say that's the edit I wanna make. If I hit publish changes, Wikipedia will ask me, can you describe what you've done? Can you summarize what you've done? Do you wanna watch this page? Do you wanna know what edits are made? Do you wanna flag if this is a minor edit? You'll fill this out and you'll hit publish changes. And that will uh, that will save your edit. That's pretty much it. So here I'm going to say added a word. I'm going to select publish changes. And that's kind of it. I've now added three words to a page. And that's how you can easily edit Wikipedia. If you go to the view history of any page, you can now see that this is the edit that I've just made. And I can actually undo it. I'll just approve this undoing. And yeah. That's why I keep saying be bold and that no one edit can break Wikipedia. It's really easy to reverse changes. So if you accidentally delete too much of a page, we can easily reverse it. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go back to my slides. And yeah, that's sort of the basics of editing Wikipedia. It's all about selecting edit and selecting the user interface that you want. And now we're actually going to break off into breakout rooms and try editing Wikipedia. So uh, your mission, choose, should you choose to accept it, is that we'd like you to take a page to edit. Consider adding links to pages. You can also explore images. You can discuss that with the Wikipedia in your room. But for now, let's try improving the pages that we flagged. If you're multilingual, you are welcome to work in uh, languages other than English. And yeah, I'm going to drop in a Google Sheets link that we've created. Well, I am not going to say we, that BirdNote and all of the partners put together of all the different pages that you can edit. You'll notice that on the first page of this Google Sheet, there is some, there's a sheet called Biography Updates, where you can see a lot of different pages that you can edit. I will add here that conflict of interest is something really important to keep in mind. So 
if you know the person, if you've ever worked for them, if they've ever paid you, if they're a friend, you should not be editing their page because you have a personal conflict of interest. So try to pick someone you've never known, you've never met, someone who seems fun or interesting to you, and take a look at their page. You can see some notes. Some of them are things like, you know, update with publications. Is there any new information that's come out? So you may want to Google their name, check out the news related to them, and see whether there's information that you can add. And I will stop here because our fellow Wikipedians will also have more suggestions for you. But yeah, pick someone interesting, try editing Wikipedia, and we'll come back in about 30-ish minutes to hear how it went. We might talk about creating pages then if people are feeling up to it. But for now, let's try editing a page and let's try improving the pages that exist. Uh, before we head off, and oh, Nick has an important thing that say a comment that says, should we know what we are working on so we don't duplicate work? Yes. So there's a column in each of these spreadsheets where it says who is editing this page. If you're editing that page, just drop your name so that we're not duplicating work because Wikipedia will only save the most recent person who is saved. So if you save before someone else, your edits will show up, but the other person won't know. It's fun. It's not like working on Google Docs in that way. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we're ready. Does anyone have any questions before we head off into breakout rooms? If you do have questions, there is a Wikipedian in each room who can answer your questions. And I promise we're very nice and we might not know the answer, but we're very good at Googling too. Awesome. So Bibi, if you want to head send us off into rooms, that would be awesome. So as we're all settling back, we have nine minutes left. And I just wanted to invite people to think about what they felt as they edited. Feel free to share your thoughts in the chat. I just sadly interrupted a really great conversation we were having about sort of dominant cultures and what ends up in Wikipedia and who's writing the pages and how it influences what's seen onwards. So I won't dive into that because people were talking about it, but feel free to share your thoughts. How did you feel about editing Wikipedia? Was editing the hard part was, or was it finding information and deciding how to write? So I will give everyone a minute or two to think about that. Feel free to jot down one word or two or a sentence while I pull out the stats from today. Oh, Dara, you're welcome to share. Um, so I, I found this incredibly helpful. I thought I'd be a lot more productive. Not to say I wasn't productive, but um, being in this space and having everybody struggling at the same time and figuring out things was incredibly helpful to me. Um, and I definitely foresee myself continuing after this because I, I thought I'd be writing more, but all I did was upload a photo. Not to say that that one upload didn't do anything because it did a lot but I'm just grateful that others are here with me asking questions. Otherwise I'd be very lost. Mm -hmm. If it helps, the first time I ever wrote a page, I accidentally lost all my work. <laughs> so I had to rewrite from scratch. So it takes time to write Wikipedia pages and we are going to make mistakes and we're going to struggle, but that's why it's really helpful to be together when you're editing that first time. So you can ask the questions that you have on your head save your work don't be like me there's another comment in the chat that says uh just getting started was a bit anxiety producing but there were definitely a couple of areas where i could improve the page even though i knew nothing about the person nicole's added i always forget how much time it takes to make even a small edit absolutely karen i noticed that you've unmuted do you have a thought to share yeah i would just share that um i was doing some some updates kind of organizing some of the person's writings um, chronologically and such. And then when I went to, um, to publish it, I got an error 
that said that there was a conflict, right? And so I didn't know what that was. I was and it showed me some stuff and, and I was like, okay, I, I thought I did it right. I don't know why. And it turns out, just for everybody else's um, information, that when somebody else is also editing the same page, then when you go to publish, you could get these um, edit conflicts and it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you've done it wrong. It's just that something you know else is going on. And so we talked a little bit about whether or not there's a way to tell that um, somebody else is also editing. And um, it's a little bit of a hack, a little bit of a workaround, but if you go into the version history, and I would suggest that you do this before you start making changes, because if you see that a, a new edit has happened like just you know, 30 seconds before or, you know, the same day or whatever might be a good indication that somebody else is working on that page at that moment. And maybe you just wait a little while, you know, to do that so that you don't have those um, editing conflicts and lose what you've done when, when you have done that. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to share that. Yep. Sadly, unlike Google Docs, you do not know who is on that Wikipedia page and who may be editing. So definitely check out the view history button. It's right next to the edit button and you can see how recently or how late people have been editing. We're down to four minutes. So I'm going to hurry this up so that PB and Nick can take over the stage. But in general, thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm loving reading your comments. I'm so glad that people are learning from each other and that you've had fun and that yes, it can sometimes take time to put it together, but over time, you'll become faster. You'll find your niche. One of the folks in our group has realized that, you know, editing grammar, editing spelling, fixing, you know, line spaces is also a way. There are also ways to improve pages. And maybe that could be your niche. Or maybe your niche is creating and editing pages. You'll find it as you sort of edit more over the time. And with that, I will say that if you head back to our dashboard page, the stats are not updated, but if you return back in a week or so, or another day, you'll notice that the numbers will go up. So as of 30 minutes ago, we had edited five pages. We had at, we've added about 800 pages. 57 people have, you know, done all this work. These are not the most up-to-date stats. This was only live as of 30 minutes ago, and I can't seem to force an update, but You'll find out the final stats in an email, hopefully, afterwards that we can send BB and Nick. But thank you all for coming in. I can already see how those edits are adding up and how we're helping change the burning pages that exist on Wikipedia. I'm going to pass it right back to BB and Nick for the last words. I just want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, this has really been amazing. Um, and just um, also want to open up space for any of the partners, if any of the partners wanted to Add any final words or any any thanks as well. Okay, well, thank you again, and we will uh, hopefully continue the work, and we'll see you out there. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.